Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Resilient Health Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Darren Ingalls, and joining me on the podcast today is one of my dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Terry Walls. And if you're not familiar with Dr. Walls' work, she's just uh, an amazing doctor, researcher, author. She's a clinical professor at the University of Iowa and has done really, I think, groundbreaking research on diet and lifestyle and how it impacts multiple sclerosis. She's also the author of The Walls Protocol. And again, if you've been dealing with MS or autoimmune disease, you're definitely going to want to pick a copy of this book up. So Dr. Walls, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hey, thank you so much, Darren. So, you know, let's talk just a little bit first, you know, for people who might know a little bit about MS or, you know, maybe they 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 have a distant family member who's been dealing with it. Can we just talk a little bit about, you know, what is this condition and how does it impact people? You know, this was first described in the 1800s, uh, and we saw that people had white plaques in their brain, and they had difficulty with pain, uh, with weakness, and that was called multiple sclerosis to, re to re reflect that you had multiple white lesions in your brain. Uh, then over time, we understood the disease more clearly that the immune system is overacted uh, in that we have enhancing inflammatory lesions in the brain, in the spinal cord, uh, and the cranial nerves that lead to sensory disturbance and motor disturbance. And uh, the criteria is that you have to be separated by time and location in the nervous system. Uh, and you need at least two episodes to make the diagnosis of MS. Uh, in the early days, we focused on Immune, drugs that would suppress the immune system, and that slowed down the attacks and was very helpful. Now we have over uh, 20 different drugs that suppress various aspects of the immune system uh, and do turn off the enhancing lesions. But we now also know there is a degenerative part with that uh, leads to shrinking of the spinal cord and shrinkage of the brain uh, in worsening disability, even though there are no more uh, acute relapses or new enhancing lesions. So I didn't mention in the intro, but this is critically important, is that you are also an MS patient, as am I. So you and I are living yes. with this disease, and I think both managing and controlling it fairly well. Uh, can you just share a little bit about your story? Because again, I think it's an amazing yeah. story. Uh, so I'm an internal medicine doc. Uh, I believe in the you know best technology, best medicines. Uh, and then in 2000, I'm diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Uh, I, I do my research, find the best MS uh, center in the country, see their best physician, take the newest drugs. And three years later, at the age of 48, I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, I also have trigeminal neuralgia. My uh, face pain, these electrical pains starting at my temple, coming down across my jaw, are more frequent, more severe, much more difficult to turn off. I'm on maximum doses of gabapentin. I, and uh, that's when I'm asking myself, you know, am I really doing all that I can? And I uh, go, start reading the basic science, going to PubMed, uh, and I read uh, the basic science models of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, ALS, and progressive MS. And I decide that the, um, lead, the mitochondria are the drivers of disability. And I start creating a supplement cocktail for my mitochondria. The speed of my decline slows. I'm super grateful. I, I discover a study using electrical stimulation of muscles in people who are paralyzed, who are never going to walk. And I ask my physical therapist, can I add that to my uh, regimen. He says, yes, we can grow bigger muscles for you, Terry, but I don't know your brain will be able to talk to these bigger muscles. But he does give me a test session. Uh, it hurts a lot, but when it's over, I feel really great. Uh, he says that's from the endorphins. Uh, and we add the electrical stimulation uh, to my physical therapy. I discover the Institute for Functional Medicine, and I take their course in neuroprotection. I have a longer list of supplements which I add, and then I have this big aha, and Darren, I laugh at myself uh, for how long it took to have this aha, because I've already been following the paleo diet 
after having been a low-fat vegetarian for 20 years. And I've been doing the paleo diet for five years. So no grain, no legumes, no dairy. But like, what if I redesigned my paleo diet based on this long list of supplements? So uh, that's more research to figure out where that is in the food supply. And I start this new way of eating uh, December 26, 2007. Now, for your audience, at that time, I, I've been so weak that I cannot sit up in a regular chair uh, for about four years. I can walk short distances using two walking sticks. Otherwise, I'm in a zero-gravity chair with my knees higher than my nose. That's where I staff the resident clinic from, and that's how I eat my meals. I cannot uh, go out to uh, restaurants or to movie theaters. Uh, it's hard to drive more than 10 minutes. I begin to have brain fog. My uh, face pains are more fr uh, brutally uh, uh, difficult. I'm coming to terms with the fact I'm going to be bedridden by my illness. I'm probably going to become bed um, uh, demented by my illness because I'm I'm beginning to have some brain fog and that my trigeminal neuralgia will probably turn permanently on such that um, light, sound, chewing, and even talking uh, triggers the uh, face pain. And I, I start this new way of eating December 26th. By uh, the middle of January, I realize that my brain fog is lost my fatigue is lost, and my physical therapist says, Terry, you're getting stronger. He advances my exercises. I can now do the exercise and the e-stim 10 minutes twice a day instead of just once a day. And I keep advancing my exercises. Uh, in February, I, and, and this is really quite dramatic the day I do that, I decide to mail a letter, and I'm walking in the hallway with my walk, walking sticks, you know, stunning my, co my partners. Then I'm walking with one walking stick and then no walking sticks. And then in May on Mother's Day, I uh, tell my family I want to try riding my bike. So we have an emergency family meeting. Uh, my wife, Jackie, tells my 16-year-old son, who's six foot five, he's a big boy, <laughs> Zach, you jog alongside on the left. She tells my daughter, who's 13, you jog alongside on the right. She'll follow. And we all get into position. She gives the all clear. I push off on my bike and I bike around the block. And that big 16 year old boy, he's crying. The 13 year old girl, she's crying. Jackie's crying. And, and when I talk about this now, you know, tears come to my eyes now because it was at that moment that I understood that who knows how much recovery might be possible, that the current understanding of secondary progressive MS is not quite right, that who knows how much recovery might happen. So every day, I, you know, I bike a little bit more. And then in October, Jackie says, honey, let's sign you up for the Courage Ride. It's 18.5 miles. However far you go um, uh, will be a triumph. Uh, and so uh, we signed me up. You know, at that point, I'd only biked eight miles. That was as far as I'd gone. Uh, and I have to rest every five miles. But I crossed the finish line. And once again, you know, uh, my kids are crying. Jackie's crying. I'm crying. And this fundamentally changes how I think about disease and health. It will change the way I practice medicine in the traumatic brain injury clinic and primary care clinic. Uh, the VA will ultimately pull me out of primary care, and we create a new clinic called the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic. My uh, chair of medicine uh, directs me to write, get a case report written up, which we do, and then a little case series, which we do. And then he pulls me back and says, and now you're going to start doing clinical trials. Uh, and you know th that all started in 2009, and here we are, 2023. So... Well, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, that journey in more detail, but, um, you know, had I never gotten MS, I would be a physician administrator, uh, uh, probably fairly high up in the BA system, a regional uh, network medical director, and that would, and I'd still be doing marathons and triathlons, and it would be great. 
However, now that I have MS, my work has touched the lives of millions. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm thrilled to have this life. I, I, you know, I think this is a much more exciting life than uh, the other life would have been. Well, it, it's such a remarkable story. And again, as a, a person also living with MS, it's inspiring to me because when I first got diagnosed, which was long after you, you know, it's the, again, as a doctor, you know a lot, you learn a lot when you're in you know, medical school and residency. And of course, most neurologists uh, don't paint a very nice picture of where things go with MS. And, uh, you know, when I read your story long before I, I met you, it's like, wow. I mean, Again, you kind of buck the system on this idea of what happens with neurodegenerative disease and this yeah. idea that you can't slow it down, you can't reverse it. Uh, and of course, you and I have met people over the years that have been able not only to control their MS and other autoimmune diseases, but actually reverse the symptoms. And I, I like I said, I think, you know, yeah. that's opening this now very large door that uh, more and more doctors, I think, are starting to become aware of that, you know, through some of the things you talk about in your book, and I think we can talk a little bit about that, you know, that there is a path that you can really improve your health. You know, absolutely. But when I first started talking, I, I was talking to uh, people at the organic grocery store, uh, in little uh, churches and uh, schools, uh, and the local MS chapter wanted me to talk to them. I said, sure. I got interviewed by the clinical advisory committee who thought my my message said, I'll tell my story and tell people to work with their primary care doc to improve their diet and ask for physical therapy and that there's hope. And they thought that was dangerous. So I got banned as a speaker. Uh, but fortunately, I just kept going where I was invited. Uh, and fortunately, my uh, chair of medicine uh, was a rheumatologist who said, Terry, what you have done is so remarkable and that a case report can change everything. The clinician who says, this was an unexpected outcome, I'm gonna write it up, put it in the context of, the, of what we know about this disease, could change everything. Uh, and you know, uh, he, um, I, I love Dr. Rothman. So uh, we wrote up that case report, then he had me come back, we did a little case series. It goes, now Terry, you, you, you have to start doing clinical trials. And I said, I, I don't know how to do that. You know, I wasn't trained, so I'll get you the mentors. This is so important. Uh, and of course, he was right. This this has changed everything. Well, I know we could have a very long conversation about your approach to MS, but maybe you can give us kind of the Cliff Notes version of that, because I want to talk a little bit about your clinical research as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, my original message is that diet really matters. Uh, and for the longest time, that was really uh, disagreed with, uh, that all you have to do is take the disease-modifying drugs. Uh, and now I'm thinking about the consortium of MS centers, which is where big international meeting where the people who take care of MS go. And uh, those of us who do research, we go and present our research. There are thousands of people there. Uh, this last time, uh, we presented uh, five research posters, uh, gave uh, three oral presentations uh, about our work. And the PhDs were talking about the basic biology of MS. Uh, and they were talking about um, disease course, uh, clinical outcomes, uh, and the theory that accelerated aging drives MS. What was remarkable, Darren, is that in every one of the PhD lectures that I attended, uh, and they're talking about the biology, to a person they said, and we have to be t uh, teaching our patients to improve their diet. That diet- Did you fall biology, out of your chair? <laughs> well, the other thing that was wild is, uh, time and time again, people would come up with their phone and say, you know, are you Dr. Walls? I have a couple questions, so I'm happy to chat with them. And then they, uh, have their phone and grab someone who's walking uh, by and say, could you get a picture of me with Dr. Walls? Because my patients would so like that. So I've gone from being you know, dangerous and crazy to now being celebrated as a uh, really uh, important, critical uh, player in the dietary research. 
So, so the first really basic thing that everyone listening to this podcast, I want you to know that the concept that diet matters is being embraced by the PhD MD researchers, is being embraced by people who are attending the leading clinical meeting for MS, that diet quality really matters. And while we can have, uh, we can all say that, yes, we don't know uh, if there'll ever be one diet that is the best diet, but we can, and I think uh, people were remarkably agreeing on this one. Sugar is bad. Processed food is bad. Fast food is bad. Uh, and so improving diet quality in a way that you and your family can do will be very, very important. So uh, to anyone who's listening, I invite you to sit down with your family and have a conversation like, what are the foods that we'd be willing to eat more of? What are the foods that we could agree we'd like to reduce? And I'll give you a few suggestions. Uh, eat more vegetables. Pick out the ones that you guys like and eat more of them. And then uh, look at how do you reduce added sugar in your diet? So if you're eating sugar-sweetened beverages, count up how many you're eating and decide you're going to reduce it by one. Uh, and do that every week until it's down to zero. That's a great simple start. Uh, and then uh, the next thing that I'd have you do is uh, physical activity. Uh, and if you have multiple sclerosis or a neuroimmune condition like um, neuromyelitis uh, optica syndrome disorder, NMOSD, or uh, another neuroimmune condition, be physically active. So ask for a referral for an exercise program. You could ask for a physical therapy referral so they can see where you're at and I give you help you design a home exercise program, or you could ask for a referral to a uh, physical um, uh, somebody who will do a personal trainer and f figure out what exercise you enjoy and get you uh, walking or jogging or biking or weightlifting or doing yoga or tai chi, but it should be something you like because if you don't like it, you won't keep it up. Exactly. I think those two starting points uh, are a great place to start. Absolutely. And, you know, I think for people who uh, might not completely understand this concept of how, why diet matters, you know, when we look at the research on how important your gut microbiome is, you know, your friendly bacteria, we've got clear evidence that there is a difference in people with MS and those who do not have MS on their gut microbes. And by eating the kind of diet that you're talking about, it really promotes better diversity in those gut bugs. So, you know, we have, a again, a way to shift our gut diversity that works in our favor so that, you know, the gut and the brain are so intimately related to one another that we, we can't just focus on the brain itself. We really have to make sure we've got a healthy gut to ensure that the inflammation occurring in the brain is minimized. You know, my you and I have uh, clearly observed uh, in ourselves, that addressing diet and lifestyle has a huge impact. And if my uh, I get the wrong food or I'm not taking care of myself as well, then I'm more likely to have my face pain turn on. The PhD community, uh, the people who review NIH uh, for uh, uh, funding big studies, their response is, I don't think a, uh, I believe patient reported outcomes. I need to see clinical measures and I need to see the molecules change. So unless I could have a study that tells me what molecules changed, I don't believe it. Well, the good news is as we get better and better at analyzing really big data sets, so we can look at all the metabolites or, or I should say more of the metabolites. Uh, so there are studies that can look at literally thousands of metabolites, these are the molecules in the urine, blood, uh, spinal fluid, poop, and how they change. When your disease is active, when your disease is not active, we're beginning to understand 
that a little bit better. And then we have to use something called machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence to make sense of this incredibly complex data. And we are just beginning to look at, because because we have blood, we have urine, we have stool, um, uh, and we have clinical outcome data. And so we're beginning to analyze using, uh, again, artificial intelligence, machine learning, what changes we see. Uh, and I am you know, very excited. We'll be reporting that. Uh, we're beginning beginning to analyze this stuff uh, this summer. And I'm hopeful that in next year's big scientific meetings, we'll be presenting uh, this information because I, I know the scientific community wants to know what are the molecules that change? What are the right. molecules that change when we change what we eat? And what is the relationship between those changing molecules and changing clinical outcomes? Uh, and then we also have uh, this really rich data on uh, changes in the uh, something called ocular coherence tomography, which is a amazing uh, tool that looks at changes in the retina mm -hmm. and the optic nerve uh, over time. Uh, and so we're going to be using the artificial intelligence to look at that. And like, oh my God, so uh, we're we're super excited. And so just as we're doing that in our lab, other labs around the country are, are looking at the same types of data with the dietary studies that they are doing. So again, in this next year, I think we'll have uh, probably the next couple of years, we're going to have deeper and deeper understanding of how it is that diet changes how we run the chemistry of life and how diet changes our microbiome our metabolome, uh, and how all of those changes lead to less anxiety, less depression, uh, greater mental clarity, better coordination, better strength. It, it's it's very exciting stuff. Yeah, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about the research, uh, I, I know you've already published, you know, a handful of studies, and what I what I love about it is that. As far as I know, they've all been positive. <laughs> they've all yeah, shown yeah. improvements so, in mobility and uh, you know yeah, daily so function. Our, our very first study uh, was a single arm study. We uh, uh, I wrote a protocol out of everything that I did, all the supplements, the meditation, the exercise, the e-stim, and we had other people with progressive multiple sclerosis, either secondary progressive or primary progressive. We enrolled them. They're between a cane and a uh, walker or two walking sticks. And we were able to show that they could implement everything that I did. They exercised, they did their ESTEM, they radically changed their diet. And there was a, a, a very significant reduction in fatigue, uh, improvement in quality of life, uh, re reduction in anxiety and depression, uh, improvement in uh, working memory, verbal memory, nonverbal memory, and as a group, we kept the walking uh, ability level and uh, we kept hand function level. Uh, and half of these folks had clinically meaningful improvement in walking function, which is remarkable because you expect a 10 to 15% decline every year. Uh, right. So, so uh, that was very exciting. Then we started studying just diet. Uh, and so... Then we started doing randomized weightless controlled studies. So that meant you either got the diet immediately or you had to wait 12 weeks and then you got the diet. In that first study, um, we showed that um, uh, hand function improved, working memory improved, uh, fatigue reduced, quality of life improved in the diet group compared to the control group. Uh, then uh, in the next study, which is a a comparison of the low saturated fat diet uh, to the modified paleo diet or the Walls diet. We had a 12 week observation period and uh, fatigue, quality of life, walking endurance um, was this, you know stable during the observation period as you'd expect. Then um, once people came in, they got randomized to the low fat diet, which is a swank diet or the um, 
uh, modified paleo diet, which is the Walls diet. Those folks, um, fatigue reduced in both groups, uh, reduced more in the Walls group than the Swank group. Um, but again, I, I want people to know that improving your diet, whether you choose to do with the low-fat diet or the um, modified paleo diet, you reduce your fatigue. Then quality of life, there's physical health quality of life, mental health quality of life. Both diets improved, both physical health and uh, mental health. The modified paleo diet improved at about twice as much as the uh, low-fat diet. But again, I want to be clear, both both diets were helpful. Uh, the uh, six-minute walk test, which is walkie endurance, neither diet changed much at 12 weeks, which is probably not surprising because we told people to not add an exercise program because we we're trying to do a diet study. Right. Uh, but it was super interesting. The modified paleo group at 24 weeks had a, a clinically significant um, uh, uh, better endurance uh, and statistically, you know, very significant uh, better endurance. Now, the p value between the low fat and the modified paleo group was 0.08, so that's a trend. It's not statistically different, uh, but certainly very interesting. And then working memory, um, which is sort of like the RAM in your computer. It's how well you can hold information in your mind where you go on to the next task. Uh, that improved in the low-fat group at 12 weeks, not in the paleo group, uh, but at 24 weeks, both the paleo group and the low-fat group had equivalent improvements in working memory. Uh, then we've been doing since uh, some secondary analyses of additional data. We know that anxiety and depression uh, uh, reduced or improved. So less anxiety, less depression in both diets. Uh, we also know that uh, 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 something called um, behavioral control. So my sense of my ability to control my impulses uh, improved in both groups. And uh, um, something called uh, personal affect, which basically is how joyful I am, that improved in both groups. We just presented that data at the consortium uh, center that I uh, spoke about. Uh, we talked about uh, something called MS functional composite, which uh, is an analysis of how fast you walk, 25 feet, how coordinated your hands are, manipulating nine pegs, and your working memory. It's a combined measure, so it's a measure of disability. Uh, and I'm pleased to tell you that both diets had less disability uh, at uh, 12 weeks and at 24 weeks. Uh, that's objectively measured. And this is the first time there's a diet study that looked at that and reported it like, you know, that's a really big deal. We can decrease your disability using this radical thing known as vegetables, folks. Very exciting stuff. Well, I think what's even more exciting is that, you know, you're looking at, I'll say, relatively short-term studies, and we're looking at like three months. You can imagine what's going to happen when it's six months and a year and two a years. A year and, and two years and three years. So, yeah. um, so another study that we uh, presented was what's the effect of an online commercially available program that teaches people about diet uh, and lifestyle and a wellness program, commercially available. Uh, I, and it, it's a, uh, so people got access to the program or they had to wait 12 weeks and get access to the program. And again, we're able to show reduction in fatigue, improvement in quality of life. We, uh, uh, as you went through the program compared to not going through the program, uh, uh, super exciting, super interesting because you just got access to the program. Uh, and uh, that was uh, the program that uh, we host uh, on our website. I, I, now to make sure that we had you know, conflict of interest managed, I had no contact with any of those people. Uh, the study team, the statistician analyzing the data, has has no contact with the team, uh, in no contact with me. They're they're masked, so we're we're very careful 
uh, to manage the conflict of interest. Uh, and the statistician sends a report to the conflict of interest committee to verify uh, what the findings are so that we, we behave appropriately. Uh, and we have another trial that we are doing right now, the efficacy of diet on quality of life. Uh, that is a two-year study that is looking at comparing the ketogenic diet that stresses olive oil, a, a modified paleo diet that we've been studying uh, for years now, uh, to usual diet. People come in, uh, they have to have MS that's been diagnosed according to the McDonald's criteria. Uh, they come in, they get uh, uh, all of their assessments. They are then randomized, and they are trained on either the keto diet or the paleo diet, or they're told, you know what, you're just going to follow a usual diet, and we'll give you some tips and recipes once a month, uh, uh, little cooking videos. So you still get some resources to improve your diet. You come back in three months for repeat assessments and blood work. And you uh, complete questionnaires every three months. You come back at 24 months for repeat assessments. We get research MRIs without contrast at time zero and time uh, 24 month. And the big question is, what's the impact on quality of life? We'll have clinical measures so we know the impact on walking, vision, hand function, thinking. And we're going to know, did your brain volume change? And could, did we get brain volume loss to healthy rates of aging? Because, and this is, you know, Darren and I think about this, we know that people with MS, as a group, our brains shrink 1% per year, which is why we have higher rates of cognitive decline, higher rates of frailty, higher rates of job loss, higher rates of nursing home care. What I see in my clinic, and I'm sure what you see in your clinic, Darren, is as we work with people to address diet and lifestyle, the anxiety goes away, mental clarity improves, they're not losing their jobs, they're still walking, hiking, biking, and having a great life. I One of my hypotheses is that I'm going to get people to healthy rates of brain volume loss. And I think that'll be the most interesting paper that we write. Now, my primary outcome is about quality of life, but again, some of those secondary measures, we'll look at clinical measures and what happens to brain volume. So when is that trial, uh, when will that be concluded? That'd be end of 2024? So, so we are recruiting now, and, okay. every, and to the listeners, go to terrywalls.com forward slash MS study, and you'll see more about uh, the study and the cute little video from me telling you about the study in a, a place for you to click and screen and hopefully begin to get enrolled. We've enrolled uh, 90 people in randomized 90. I have room for 65 more. Uh, and so I'm hoping that with the uh, success that you're going to have uh, with this uh, little podcast uh, and the MS Summit that we're doing, that we will be able to finish our enrollment early and uh, finish our enrollment by the end of 2023 or very early 2024. We'll then follow people for two years. Uh, and so we'll be data cleaning, hopefully uh, in the end of 2026, uh, writing up our, our stuff and sending it off to present in at the Consortium of MS Centers in spring of 2027. And then submitting it for publication in fall of 2027 and hopefully, you know, get it published and out in the spring of uh, 2028. Fantastic. Research is a long distance sport. Yes. This is not a sprint, folks. This is uh, a long distance uh, endurance sport. Changing the world uh, is about it, you know, doing the research so I, uh, I can have the citations. Uh, in doing podcasts like what you're doing, Darren, doing uh, things like the MS Summit to reach thousands of people and hopefully millions of people. So people who are willing to start now doing diet and lifestyle can start now. They won't have to wait the 30 years that it takes to change the standard of care. Well, the good news is you've already got a book that goes through this whole process, The Walls Protocol. We're going to drop a link into the show notes with a link to the book. 
And again, what I really appreciate about your word, Terry, is that it doesn't just apply to MS patients. I mean, you and I are obviously invested in this game, but this is really for anyone who's been struggling with any autoimmune illness. You know, what we learn in functional medicine is that the, the foundational things that we use to treat MS is really no different than if you're dealing with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and other types of, you know, degenerative inflammatory disorders. And, you know, you and I both have the experience of applying these principles to these other autoimmune illnesses, and we see clinical improvement. Absolutely. So for many of those autoimmune illnesses that you just mentioned, they have what I call neuroimmune symptoms. They have um, psychiatric issues with anxiety, depression, irritability, uh, brain fog. They may have um, pain. Uh, that is beyond what you would expect for the rheumatoid arthritis. They may have neuropathic pain and neuropathy pains as well. Uh, so this can be super helpful for them to address all the psychiatric symptoms and the additional neuroimmune symptoms. Well, I want to wrap up the podcast uh, talking a little bit about this summit that you have coming up. So you're putting on a, a virtual online summit that is absolutely free. Uh, I know it runs from July 5th through July 11th, but can you just uh, give us a little yeah. inside peek? So uh, I interviewed 50 folks, uh, a mixture of clinicians uh, like you, Darren, uh, that talked about specific things that we can be doing that are under our control to better manage anxiety, depression, uh, irritable bowel, constipation, uh, loss of sexual desire. I, uh, and then... Uh, PhD scientists talking about some very interesting uh, new science that's coming out. And then entrepreneurs, so we talked about new technologies, again, that we can use to accelerate our recovery, to do a better job of uh, improving my strength, uh, my balance. Again, um, this uh, uh, will have about eight to nine interviews each day. You'll also hear from me a, a quick um, uh, discussion each day about some interesting uh, aspect. You'll hear more about my research. And th the intent of all of this is to inspire you, A, with hope, because you're going to hear some amazing recovery story, uh, to learn about the things that you can do to have a higher quality of life. I and things that you can do working with your primary care doc or your specialist to improve your function and quality of life. It's free. It's online. Uh, so people can participate from anywhere in the world, but you have to pre-register. Well, again, we'll put the link in the show notes uh, that you can register again for this free event. And for people tuning in, please, if you're struggling with MS or any autoimmune disease, or if you've got friends, family, loved ones, please share this link with them because it's just so important to have this information. And we know that so many people dealing with these chronic illnesses, you know, like you said, you know, often there is a loss of hope. You know, you've been told by your rheumatologist, neurologist that you're going to progress, your symptoms are just going to get worse. And the best you can do is some sort of disease modifying drug that at best may slow the progression down, but often they offer very little hope that. You can control this, reverse it, and improve your quality of life. So it's just so important yeah. to share with people. And again, I'll also encourage people, not just register, but you're going to want to own this event. You know, you like I said, you brought in 50 of the top people out there, and myself included, uh, to course. talk about- That was a know, great conversation. <laughs> to talk about all these different aspects. And you're going to want this as part of your library because you're going to want to go back to it again and again as a resource, again, for you, your family, your friends, your loved ones. Uh, so I would just encourage folks uh, to register, buy the event. It's 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 offered at a very inexpensive price. I forget what it runs. I think it's like thirty seven or forty seven dollars to own the event. So it's uh, it's not expensive, and again, the value you get for it is really quite high. You know, um, so for people with MS, the average time to job loss is seven years. Uh, the DMTs can slow. Uh, the conversion to wheelchair uh, from 15 years to 20 years, uh, which is good. I mean, that is great progress. 
if you also do diet and lifestyle, all the self-care, you can improve your function. You can improve your quality of life. We have people hiking, biking, jogging. They are getting their lives back. And I want everyone who's listening to know there's so much that you can do. Uh, and this is true for people with MS, the other neuroimmune conditions, including things like myasthenia gravis, uh, uh, mononeuritis multiplex, chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathies. These are all autoimmune conditions wrecking your peripheral nerves, your spinal cord, your brain. There's so much you can do. Well, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Your work is inspiring. It's a, a pleasure to have gotten to know you over the years. And I, I just appreciate everything you do for our community. Much love to you, you as well, Darren. All right. Thank you.